Uh, by the way, I, I do want to uh, say I, I did listen to the message last Sunday. How many are grateful for the message that uh, Pastor Dave Hurtwick brought to us? It's just, just amazing. Uh, that guy never disappoints. He's just such a phenomenal communicator, and I enjoy listening to him uh, speak God's word. Um, this is the last Sunday in the series. We've actually taken 10 weeks to look at uh, how the Holy Spirit comes into our world and into our lives to work in us and partner with us to make a difference in our world. And today, I actually want to uh, end the series by talking about what is really the most controversial of the spiritual gifts. And the reason it's controversial really has more to do with how people have done things rather than how God has done things. But uh, I do want to conclude the message with, uh, or this series, uh, on, on the idea of speaking in tongues. What is that? And, and for uh, our purposes in our conversation today, I'm actually going to use the, the term spiritual language. There's a reason that I do that, and it's not as though I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the term speaking in tongues. It's just so many people have a negative uh, emotional reaction when they hear that phrase. And so uh, when I use the phrase uh, spiritual language, I'm talking basically about the same thing, but I think it helps maybe um, helps us reframe some concepts in our own thinking. I know that for some people, you may have a negative concept of, of this idea of spiritual language, and that can come from a couple of places. Maybe you were someplace and a person just startled you. Uh, you were sitting next to or near someone, and they just, they all of a sudden started uh, exercising spiritual language very loudly, and it startled you. And, uh, and you thought, that, that can't be good, and I, I would prefer that didn't happen. Uh, let's just check, how many people like to be startled? That's what I thought. <laughs> it's not a lot of people do. And then uh, there are some places where uh, when this topic is addressed uh, scripturally, there are people who have some very grave concerns about this gift, and, and they, they talk about it in ways that can actually be a little bit demeaning. And I don't think it's their heart. I think they're reacting to what have been maybe some misuses or even abuses of a spiritual gift. And so because of that, uh, uh, they, they kind of weigh in in a negative way. I'd like us just to take our cues today, not from our experience and not from what someone has said, but from Scripture. And I think you'd be surprised at what Scripture has to say about this. I think you'd be surprised how much Scripture has to say about this. Though it's not often discussed in settings like this, uh, Scripture actually weighs in quite a bit on this particular thing. First thing I want you to know is that spiritual language is biblical. It was actually foretold by the prophet Isaiah. Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection and before his ascension that this is something they should anticipate. Paul spent three chapters in his, in 1 Corinthians, uh, devoted to spiritual language, interpretation of that language, and prophecy. And so there's quite a bit of scripture. It is a biblical thing, but I also want you to know that spiritual language is not a status symbol. It's not something you earn. It's not a badge that you've arrived at something. Spiritual language, like all other gifts of the Spirit, is a gift. It's a gift. You don't get to brag about accomplishing a gift. You can enjoy a gift, you can use a gift, uh, but you don't get to take credit for a gift that was given to you. It's a gift. And spiritual language is also not a substitute for spiritual growth. Now that I exercise spiritual language, I don't need scripture. I don't need to pray other kinds of prayer. Scripture completely disagrees with that. We still need to be students of God's word. We still need to be engaged in all kinds of prayer and forms of discipleship and gathering for worship. It's not an exemption to other demands of scripture on our life. And spiritual language does not require an altered state of consciousness. You're not going to go into a seizure in order to experience this. How many are relieved? <laughs> not as many as I thought would be. Uh, Spiritual language is, is not anti-intellectual. The person who talks the most about this in Scripture is actually the most educated person in Scripture in the New Testament. It's the Apostle Paul. And he didn't see this as something that was against the intellect. Uh, Paul had a remarkable education and in, in our day would have probably been considered to have multiple doctorates. Uh, he also was multilingual. We know he spoke Hebrew. We know he spoke uh, 
uh, Aramaic. We know that he spoke Greek. Uh, it is likely that he spoke Latin because he interfaced with the uh, Roman world and may have spoken uh, languages other than that. It was one of the things that facilitated his missionary capacities as well as it did. So he was, he was multilingual, he was very educated, and yet he saw spiritual language as something that helped him because there were things he did not know and there were opportunities he didn't know how to respond to. And he saw spiritual language as a way to assist him in how he oriented himself towards that and maybe even some steps he would take as a result of that. Uh, this is what Jesus said in Mark the 16th chapter. This is after his resurrection. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak with new languages. Jesus kind of helped his disciples know this is something to anticipate, which was helpful because when it happened, they knew Jesus said this was something to anticipate. So the good question to ask would be, so what is the purpose of spiritual language? If it's not a status symbol, if it doesn't exempt me from other things and demands and, and my own spiritual growth and development, like what purpose does it actually serve? And you might be surprised, spiritual language actually strengthens you personally. Spiritual language strengthens you personally. This is how the Apostle Paul would talk about it in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. The one who speaks the word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Now, that doesn't mean that personal strength is wrong. He's just understanding. If you're going to exercise spiritual language, you have to be aware of your surroundings. And in terms of a private devotional experience, it makes you personally stronger. It's not a negative thing. This is also what the Apostle Paul said. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Aren't you glad that the way the kingdom of God is established is not that you just get awarded and rewarded for your strengths and your accomplishments, but when you need the most help, that's when God is most available. Is anybody else in the room glad about that besides me? I just think that's wonderful. That's so comforting. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. We don't know what God wants us to pray for. I often know what I want God to do, but that's not the same thing, is it? We don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Isn't this amazing? God helps us when we don't know what to pray, and, he, and the Spirit helps us pray, and when the Spirit helps us pray, we always pray in line with God's will. Like, I know for a fact there's a number of prayers I have prayed that had nothing to do with God's will. It was all about my will or someone else's will. But when, when we exercise spiritual language, it's always according to God's will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And this verse is often taken out of context. We look at, at that passage that says, we know all things work together, but it's not. The context is where we have allowed the Holy Spirit to help us intercede. We have this confidence God is at work bringing all things together for our good and for his glory. It's just a remarkable thing. So, uh, there's, this is also worth noting. There's an element of choice in spiritual language. There's an element of choice in spiritual language. Right now, I am thinking thoughts, and then I'm expressing those thoughts out loud. That's a choice. Right now, you are thinking thoughts, and you are choosing not to express your thoughts out loud, and, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, this, this would be a much more, <laughs> well, this message would go a lot longer, that's for sure. Um, there's, there's an element of, of choice. So it's, it's not as though a person who exercises spiritual language, uh, they're overtaken by something. 
Uh, I saw one person one time, he wanted to exercise spiritual language and he just opened his mouth like this and he thought it would come out like a radio. That's not, that's not how any of this works. There's an element of choice. This is how Paul talked about it. He said, if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit. I will also sing in words I understand. He's saying, I, I choose to exercise this option. It's, it's my will is involved in it. It's a gift, but you know, uh, you've been given gifts by people. Uh, has anybody here ever been given the gift of fruitcake at Christmas? <laughs> has anybody here ever eaten that stuff? No takers. Oh, there's one over here. God bless you. And if you can just give us your name and address, we will send all the fruitcake your way. Uh, we're, we're not overtaken by spiritual language. It's a decision to express something. Why is this? Why, why does God think like this? Why is this even an option? Why, why does God think this is a good idea? Because obviously a lot of people are concerned about it. And the first thing that we can say is that words are actually very powerful. In fact, God used words to create everything that exists. That's quite a remarkable statement. Most creation myths of the world from other religions don't have this idea that you start with a thought and move to words. Most is you start with some kind of other material thing. Sometimes it was an animal, sometimes it was another deity that they killed and then created a, a universe out of. But in, in creation, in Genesis, what we're told is that God uses words, and God knows words are powerful, and, and I know what you're thinking, well, his words are powerful, but my words are not. And God would disagree with you on that. Uh, God insists that he has given incredible power to people because he's given a voice to people. Now, it's true a lot of us won't use our voice in our life, but that's our choice. Or sometimes we're in situations where we feel we're not allowed to use our voice. And when you have no voice and you have no choice, that's what we call an abusive relationship. Right? And so God gives us a voice because he wants us to use our words in powerful ways. Uh, this is how uh, scripture actually refers to the words that we speak. In Proverbs 18, it says, the tongue can bring life and death. Those who talk will reap the consequences. Life and death in your, in your speech, that's quite remarkable. You say, well, uh, I, I, I don't have, I've used some pretty strong language, no one died. Did hopes die? Did dreams die? Did relationships die? Because people do that all the time, with a word. Uh, Proverbs 16 says this, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, healthy for the body. God actually says that your words can not only produce a, 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 an, an aroma of sweetness, an atmosphere of sweetness, but also provide and promote health and healing in our bodies. That's rather remarkable. In Matthew 12, it says, the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. We focus a lot on actions. Jesus says our words count too. Uh, uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, had quite a bit to say about the power of words and language. He said, we can, we can make large horses go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Just a couple of verses later, he would say this, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. No one can tame the tongue. It's restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Words are very powerful. And so God knows 
He wants to help us in our weakness. We need the Holy Spirit to assist us in our prayers because we don't always know what God wants. He might have ideas and options that have never entered into my imagination. We don't know what God wants. We don't always know what God can do. I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. And it's amazing how often we think that our limits are also limits to God. But, but God can do more than we can do. And we don't always know what needs to change. In fact, we often think about outcomes. I'd like the outcome to be different. But what needs to change to get us there? That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We don't know what needs to be adjusted, what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be changed in order to get us to a different kind of outcome. And we don't always know what kind of difference can be made. Most people in our world right now, when I listen to them talk, they assume nothing can make any difference. They're just, they're, they're beside themselves. They, they, not, nothing I do can make a difference. Everything is set in stone. And there's this kind of fatalism that attaches itself to people when the circumstances are overwhelming. And yet the Holy Spirit comes to us and he wants to assist us and he wants to help us because there are things that we don't know and we can't change and we don't know how to make the difference. But God can do all of those things. And aren't you glad the Holy Spirit comes to help us know how to do that too? It's just amazing. Yeah, it's great. So God knows our limitations and he wants to Assistance. Now, this is where it's really important. Are you ready for this? You are not better if you exercise spiritual language, and you are not worse if you don't. There's no class system in, in spiritual Christianity. It's not like I've been on lots of planes where there's a first class. Anybody ever seen that class? Yeah, they have better seats. They actually get food that's edible. And, uh, and, and where I sit, uh, I'm not a big person, and the seat is, is tiny, and my knees are right up to my chest, and somebody goes by and throws a bag of, I'm not sure what carbohydrate it is, at me, and, and asks me if I want water, and they give me the, this teeniest, tiniest cup that I used to use to feed our bird. You know, it's just like that. It's like that. And, but, but first class, and some people think spirituality is like that. They're like, there's first class, and, the, and then there's coach. That's not how it works. Uh, there's no upgrade when you get to heaven. People who speak, get, speak uh, use spiritual language aren't getting bigger mansions or better options on, on their eternal dwellings. That's, that's not how it works. God does not love us more or less if we exercise spiritual. It has nothing to do with any of that. The question is, the question is, what might God do? What might God release into our lives and into our world? if we were willing to trust him even with the sounds and syllables that come from our lips. That's quite an interesting thing. So the Apostle Paul actually devoted 15% of 1 Corinthians to this topic. And he regulates the use of spiritual language because too much of a good thing is never a good thing. And so this is how he describes it, all right? This is the Apostle Paul. Some people think, uh, if you come from Pentecostal and charismatic backgrounds, some people think that any regulation of a spiritual gift is, is quenching the spirit. But listen to what Paul says. He says, even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking in unknown language, they will think you are, what's the next word? Crazy. <laughs> and Paul says, we don't want them to think that. We don't. Paul did not see the regulation of a spiritual gift as a quenching or a compromise. He saw it as a necessity. You had to be aware of your surroundings. So I want to tell you a story. It's a very personal story for me, and I don't tell this very often. And the only reason I'm telling is because this is the topic. I was in college. If you don't know, I was originally wanted to be an attorney because attorneys make more than pastors. It's just true. And... Uh, so I went to University of Buffalo, and my major was political science and history, and um, I, I had a roommate. I, I lived in 582 Fargo Quad, uh, also known as Hell Hole, and um, I had uh, uh, two roommates, one of which was from China, and uh, he was an atheist, and so he found out that I was a believer in God, and we had lots of conversations, and I don't know where he got the idea. I had not brought it up, but he asked me, he said, do do you believe that Christians can speak uh, in languages they have not learned? I said, I, I do believe that. And he said, have you ever experienced that? And I said, I have experienced that. And he said, show me. 
And I, I felt very uncomfortable doing that because for me, this is rather a private thing. And I didn't feel like it's something that you just, you, you put on display like that. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I, I hope you'll understand. And he was fine with it. And so we, we turned out the lights and, and we went to bed. In the, in the middle of the night, I woke up. And when I woke up, his face was this close to my face. And uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night and uh, a person's face is this close to your face, you will do what I did, and that is yell. And I, I said, what are you doing? And, and he says, you were talking in your sleep. I said, that doesn't change the question. What are you doing? Like, why are you here? And he told me, he said, you were speaking in Chinese. I, I couldn't believe it. And here I am, a believer. <laughs> And the thing I love about that, that story is I can't take any credit for it. I was asleep. I was unconscious. I was not doing anything except sleeping. But I do remember the dream I was having. And in my dream, I was talking to my friend Clifford Chi Khan Lee about Jesus. And I was telling him who Jesus was in every book of the Bible. I was in my dream, I'm telling him. In Genesis, Jesus is the word that creates all things. And in Exodus, he's the sacrificial lamb that takes our place so we don't have to die. And in Leviticus, he's our high priest that represents us to God and God to us. And in Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud that protects us from the heat of the day and the pillar of fire by night that gives us guidance even in the darkest times. And in Deut uh, that was Deuteronomy, or in Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. And, and I was just going through the, the Old Testament like that, and, 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 and suddenly I woke up, and that's when I yelled. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? I, I absolutely love, I love this story because I can't take any credit for it. But God wanted Clifford Chi Conley to know him and who his son was. And Clifford actually became a believer, not right then. But it was one of the steps that helped him move in that direction. There's one more thing. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. There's one more thing. Um, I, uh, I have a, a license um, uh, to drive. And, uh, and I'm hanging on to this as long as I can. <laughs> That's not for you. It's for my wife and kids. Uh, when I get older, I'm going to fight over this. I, I know I am. But... Um, uh, this, this actually tells you my age, and there was a time in my life when that was an important thing, because I was going places where I needed to verify my age. I know no one knows what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but I did not get a license to prove how old I was. I got a license because I wanted to be able to go places into, in, a, in a car that I could not go on foot or on a bicycle. And the reason that I exercise spiritual language, it's not to prove anything to myself or anyone else or to God. There's places in prayer I cannot go on my own. There's things I don't know. There's things I don't understand. And the, and the Apostle Paul says one of the most remarkable things. He says that the Holy Spirit can help us even with groans. Even when groans. But even when you can't articulate syllables, the Holy Spirit can help us. Now, maybe you're sitting here and, and you're interested in this. The first thing I want you to know is I, I'm not going to put you on the spot in any way. Not at all. I, I don't think that adding pressure to you is going to be helpful in any way. So you're off, you're off the hook. But if you are interested, how would you go about this? And the, the first thing I would tell you is, dare to believe you're not excluded from this gift. On the day of Pentecost, Peter actually said this, this gift is for you, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and as many generations as come. You're not exempt. Uh, secondly, I would encourage you to worship. Not because we're trying to butter God up and get something from him. 
But when it comes to receiving something from God, it is so easy to become very self-focused, to turn our attention on ourselves. And we get all frozen up and dislocated when we do that. But if we can turn our attention to the one who loves us more than we could possibly imagine, the one who has given more than we could possibly calculate, the, the one who thinks about us always, if we can focus our attention on him, it puts us in a better position to be able to receive. It doesn't change his willingness to give. We just, when, I, when I'm focused on myself, I get very self-conscious. And then ask. You're not earning, but you are allowed to ask. And then when you do that, I'm, I'm going to ask you to be, if this is going to require a little bit of trust, a little bit of bravery, a little bit of faith, to be honest. And that is, after you've done that, if a syllable or a word or a phrase comes to your mind, you don't know what it is, I'm going to ask you to, by faith, just say it out loud. Well, that doesn't sound very spiritual, and yet it is. The Holy Spirit can take even our groans, our sighs, syllables that mean nothing to us, but everything to him. And he can translate it into the will of God so that God's will begins to flow into our lives and into our world. And is there anyone in this room that agrees with me? Our world needs more of God's will and a little bit less of ours. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, so Father, would you help us today? Um, you are so gracious. Uh, sometimes we're intimidated by gifts that you give. Uh, we establish a kind of worth about ourselves. And sometimes we actually become afraid of a gift because of how we've seen it exercised by someone else. I ask that you would, you would erode our fears and our insecurities and help us just focus on you. And for those who are willing to receive at some point today or this week, uh, when they're just alone with you, would you give them a syllable, a word, a phrase? And as they speak it, let your spirit intercede for them according to your will. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.